Laurent Soulier is a professor and researcher at the University of Pau, where he gives courses in parasitology. Tomorrow, Laurent will fly to the other side of the world to conduct a mission three years in the making. It's an exceptional adventure, a lifetime event, along with a discovery that could very well save the last humpback whales on the planet. Laurent decided to start his mission in New Caledonia. He came here seeking the expertise of a scientist in the field, a PhD in biology and international specialist on humpback whales, Claire Gary. Okay, so here we're going to leave the Southwest Lagoon to reach Prawny Bay, which is where our study area begins. Then I hope we'll be lucky enough to see a few humpback whales because they're starting to arrive now. So the whales stay more or less from June to late September? Yeah, it starts mid-June and peaks in August. The humpbacks that come to New Caledonia to breed feed in Antarctica, but we have no idea where, nor the route they take from Antarctica to here. And what happens on the way? Do they stop or do they come directly here? Another thing, are there individual variations? Probably so, but we don't know anything about that for now. Imagine for a moment you are a whale. You've been swimming for days in the infinite blue sea at unbelievable depths. And then, suddenly straight ahead of you, a wall stretches toward the surface. It's an island. After traveling some 2,500 miles, you have finally arrived. This is how the whales reach the calm and sheltered waters of the Caledonian Islands every year. So every day, when the weather is good enough, we go out to sea to try to spot the animals. So here specifically, we had a few signs of whales, but it's not, well, it's not a large, large area. Starting in June, the whales arrive one after another to mate and give birth to their calves. The arrival of the first whales of the season is always a great event. Researchers are fascinated with the size and incredible fluidity of these animals. Despite weighing 40 tons, they seem to fly on the surface of the water. This is also why they are called megaptera, which means large wings in Greek. Laurent discovers an unbelievable data bank. Hundreds of photographs of tail fins taken by Claire and the members of the Operation Cetacé NGO. Each tail is unique, as individual as a fingerprint. In all, more than 600 whales have been identified in New Caledonia in 15 years. The studies we've done have shown, in fact, that we can no longer consider there is a single population but whether we have to talk about subpopulations. Therefore, there's one on the east side of Australia, one for Caledonia, one for Tonga, and here, the same thing, the Cook Islands and French Polynesia. For a long time, researchers believed there were only two distinct groups of humpback whales, those in the northern hemisphere and those in the south. Today, they now think there are separate populations that share a single feeding ground, the polar areas, but with specific breeding grounds close to the equator. If this theory proves to be true, the species is in real danger. If countries like Japan resume whale hunting, the impact on these micropopulations will be devastating. A few dozen whales killed in a single zone in the Antarctica means the population of humpback whales that breed in New Caledonia may collapse or disappear, perhaps forever. All the specialists agree, it is urgent to prove that these small populations of whales exist 
and they must be saved at all cost. But how? You have a very good network and work on a certain number of issues, the goal being the conservation of the whale populations in the South Pacific. And I would like to make a small contribution to this via something that is perhaps not very well known. They are the whale parasites, in particular the Siemide. I can show you a photograph so you can see what it looks like. It's a strange animal, about a quarter to half an inch long, you see? It really has a unique shape, something between a crustacean and a scorpion. It lives on the whale in skin lesions and doesn't move very much. We know these small crustaceans can only move from one whale to another when the animals touch. Laurent is convinced that if two siamidae taken from two different whales were analyzed and found to be genetically different, it would mean that these parasites have evolved separately and that their hosts, the groups of whales, had never met, perhaps for thousands of years. Until now, Laurent has had to wait for a beached whale to collect these precious parasites. But these events are far too rare. Time is getting short. The researchers come up with a crazy idea to figure out how to collect these parasites from living whales. In our experience here in this region, but not all the regions are the same, it's extremely rare to be able to get into the water with the whales. It's rare that they stay in one spot and we're able to get into the water. For 50 days working at sea, we can get in the water with the animals maybe once. It's no small thing to swim with a whale, and it's dangerous. Whales weigh 40 tons. They're not aggressive, but still, one whale is the size of 10 elephants. I would advise being extremely careful because there have already been accidents, like for example a cameraman whose pelvis was broken by a whale calf. The calves are not coordinated and a bit unconscious. My goal is obviously not to be aggressive. Um, I don't want to rush in there onto a whale to try to pull them off. The idea is that the whale sees me and finally gets used to my presence so that I can collect them directly from the animal. That's generally the idea. On Claire's advice, Laurent decides to leave New Caledonia in search of a smaller island with clear, calm water, a sanctuary for the humpback whales, Rurutu Island. We are now in the Austral Islands in French Polynesia. As soon as he arrives, Laurent starts looking for a fisherman who will be his guide for the mission. He doesn't head for the harbor, but to the temple. As he has heard of a man, Nahuma, said to be an excellent sailor and fisherman, but he's also a deacon. Today is Sunday, the day for Mass. But tomorrow, Monday, we can do what you want. I am studying whales, but in a different way. Rather than shoot a crossbow and sample a small piece of whale, which is a bit traumatic for the whale, I collect parasites and compare them to other parasites taken from other humpback whales in other places around the world. This is whale, it's good. <laughs> How do you plan to find such small creatures? Well, it's obviously not easy. What I'm looking for measures a quarter inch long on a whale that's 45 feet long and weighs 30 tons. The goal is to stay at a reasonable distance on the boat, about 150 feet or so, and then either swim or dive the rest of the way. You should never approach a whale from behind because it can break the boat with a slap of its tail. And never from the front either because it doesn't know that the boat can be an obstacle for it. Now. 
Rurutu is one of the northernmost islands in Polynesia and a far cry from the usual image of white sand beaches wow. and palm trees. That's great. On voit le down there. Laurent discovers an unknown side of Polynesia, a wild, untouched land. Oh. The island is an oblong landmass measuring just 14 square miles. From the top, the view is breathtaking. Oui. A whale just surfaced right there. There? Near the white spot? It has to be the same one as before. Oh, she dove. She dove, but I saw the blow clearly. It's late June. Powerful blows 20 to 23 feet high indicate the presence of whales. They've arrived right on time for their rendezvous dictated by nature. In the past, boats were the only way to reach Rurutu from Tahiti. 25 years ago, an air link was created. The island has opened up to the outside world, especially tourists who come during this season to see the whales. Everything's good. Everything is very, very good. There are any whales? Oh, uh, yes, the whale. Jan Hubert, however, is not here as a tourist. This underwater cinematographer lives year round in Polynesia on Rangiroa Atoll. It's okay, Mama, we can go. Laurent asked him to come to help with his mission. Scientists know that humpback whales come to Rurutu water to mate and give birth. This island, which has warm, shallow water and no lagoon, seems to guarantee the safety of the whale calves. Yet we know almost nothing about the births, just that they occur at night, protected from predators and the eyes of man. Ah, oh, the good Rurutu food. Yes, that will give you energy for tomorrow when you go to see the whale. Oh, that's good news. I saw a few mothers with calves, but it's hard to get close. Have you come to Rurutu often? Yes, I've come to Rurutu several times, but mostly to take photographs, images. Not at all for what you do, scientific research. A few hours ago, Laurent and Yann didn't know each other. Now they're committed to the same mission. They will share everything, the good and the bad. Winters on Rurutu are harsh, with raging seas sparing no one. Every morning, regardless of the weather, Laurent and Yann meet up at the harbor where Nahuma waits for them. As usual, he has already been out. His information is crucial because in this season, the fishermen always encounter the whales. We'll let Nahuma find us a nice sheltered spot. We'll keep an eye out on the way to see if we can identify any of the animals yet.
They settle in for a long wait. They scan the sea constantly, watching for blows and black fins in the waves of spray, the only clues indicating the presence of the cetaceans. And suddenly, there it is. Incredible. A first breach, captured by Laurent. The first whale which the men will try to approach. The initial days are spent entirely on identification. Using the photographs, Laurent gathers data, getting to know each individual whale. Did you see the baby? It's always on the other side of the whale. She's virtually carrying it on her back. You can see her large pectorals, and there she stuck her nose up. You can see a small blow, dorsal fin, and you can see the parasites on the body clearly, along the side. Finally, the magical moment of the first dive has arrived. Yann, followed by Laurent, attempts a first approach. But the whales disappear as fleeting as a mirage despite their imposing size. Lost in the deep blue sea, the divers have lost their trail. Laurent and Yann climb back on the boat, then return to the water dozens of times as they pursue the Megaptera. And finally, one day, the reward. Despite all their efforts, the men can't manage to follow the whales. Yan is a prudent man. He decides to give up. So, should we try to get closer? Ah, oh, it's magnificent. Magnificent. There's a mother. A calf on her. Fantastic. Fantastic, but it's really hard to follow her, on the other hand. She loses you with a mere flip of the tail. And you follow, you follow, you follow. I was pretty close to the tail, and then when I tried to get closer, she flipped her tail, and the difficult part, obviously, would be to manage to get very close. And we were on Avera Bay, which is not the clearest area. The first few feet of water are a bit cloudy. Later, we'll have clearer water. It'll be easier for you to identify the parasites and things like that. One day, a whale suddenly surfaces. The men name her Tapu, which means cut in Rurutu, because of the clearly identifiable shape of her dorsal fin. Tapu is an impressive female. Her calf, just a few days old, follows her like a shadow. It's nearly 13 feet long and already weighs over one ton. Tapu seems less shy than the other whales. Laurent and Yan decide to follow her for the upcoming weeks.
Shaw has set up his laboratory in their small guest house. He can view and analyze Jan's high-definition images every day. Did you see, Jan, I tried to photograph the first elements on the whale to try to identify a few parasites, but it's not easy because right away the whale turned and flapped her fin and pushed me 30 feet. I tried to get as close as possible to photograph the areas that might have parasites. There I felt I could see something. And I'm already swimming fairly fast. The mother started... Oh, there, it's tricky. That's tricky. It's pretty surprising. It's impressive to see an enormous animal, as huge as a submarine, heading toward you, and then it gives you a... as if it wanted to push you away. At that moment, the pressure exercised by the immense fluke can exceed several tons per square inch, enough to knock out a diver without even touching him. Every time we were able to get close so far, we were often behind the animal. It's deliberate by the whale. She makes sure, even if she has to turn around, to always place her tail towards us, so that she always has a way to escape. So no matter how we try to get close, in fact, she's the one who decides. Yeah, well, she's always the one who decides. Averapa lies to the east of the island. The men have to head out to sea via this narrow channel, which is almost invisible at high tide. days drag out. Two weeks have gone by. The two men return to the water time after time with Tapu, trying to photograph the Siamidae, the parasites Laurent wants to collect. But before gathering them, they have to determine exactly where they are. We'll both take cameras. I'll try to get an ID photo of the whole animal, and you try to get close-ups, okay? Okay. 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 No problem. Laurent has high hopes for these photo sessions. He knows that at birth, a calf doesn't have any parasites. It is gradually colonized via contact with its mother. But how fast does this parasitic process occur? And what are the areas of contamination? No one knows. To date, no scientist has tried to photograph an animal measuring a quarter of an inch on a 60-foot whale. So now we're going to see a photo of the calf. You can see certain places really well, including the mouth, particularly here. There, you can see them well. They're extremely clear. You see, here I was really, really close, just inches away. And then here, you can really see them very well. They're everywhere. All along here, from the jaw. Here's a big one there. And over here, a few. And it looks like a scorpion. And there's an entire community. And then here along the entire length, we're starting to see one on the first lesions. The days go by. The mother and calf are swimming constantly and refuse all contact with the divers. The photographs are real tests of endurance. Laurent's only chance of getting photographs of the whale's skin involves floating atop her. So you see on this photo, here's, a, here's certainly a, a wound or a scar. There's a large colony. There's a huge parasite community of Siamidae. Here there are a few scattered ones like this one. You can see clearly. Really big, really big. They're fairly huge. It's pretty extraordinary because on this image, it's practically the first time we've been able to see Siamidae in this way. On an animal this size, we can identify something that's a quarter inch long. It's absolutely fantastic. What I obviously hope for is that we'll be able to collect one one day. They'll have to wait. For now, the whales are keeping their distance. The divers have reached an impasse. 
there's no hope of contact on the back of the whales. Laurent is starting to have doubts. So, Laurent, you swim up by the front, always facing the animal, so it sees us clearly. I have the camera, and when you see that I'm moving back, it's because I'm leaving the way clear for you, and then you can get closer. And then you can move in slowly while I stay back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, fins, mask, and snorkel this time. We won't use bottles or anything else to stay as discreet as possible. The calf grows constantly, seemingly before their eyes. It gulps down a hundred quarts of milk a day, grows more confident, and now makes longer and longer dives. Its mother, exhausted, rests on the bottom. Sixty-five feet of water still separate the men from the animals. One day, there is an encounter, the encounter, between a man and a whale. Divers watch in amazement. The calf surfaces as an ambassador. It seems to be using all its charm and innocence to convince its mother to come as well, to see these insistent visitors that are now part of their everyday lives. Calf has given them a moment of grace, a miraculous moment of intimacy, during which Laurent has the presence of mind to record the transmission of parasites other to the calf in a series of photographs. Since the whales seem to accept the men's presence and even seek it out, Laurent decides to take a chance. For the first time in a month, he will make contact. Stopped by fear, by the challenge, by a fear of failure, he hesitates, gropes around, until a slap of the calf's fluke suddenly brings him back to reality. Jan, behind the camera, watches this failed attempt, powerless to help. He can't hide his disappointment. Oh, I was so close. I touched the head with the net. I saw this the day on the end of the rostrum and on the edge of the lips, the mouth. 
I saw them, I saw them. And then touched, then she slipped sideways, and I didn't manage to collect any of that time. There I saw them really well. There were three, four on that spot, then one on the upper lip. You could really see them. We can try to start again. But I'm not sure she'll take another little nap. We missed a really, really good chance, but there'll be others. Bad weather has hit Rurutu. Four days of rain, storms, cool temperatures and wind prevent the men from going out to sea. The scientific mission is interrupted. Time goes by and the dreary empty days force Laurent to relive his failed attempt. When they finally return to sea, they witness a scene of desolation. The flooded rivers have carried tons of silt into the clear water, which is now an immense opaque curtain, muddying the sea and concealing the whales from view. They probably don't like the murky water and have disappeared into the open sea. against time is heating up. In the hopes of finding a whale blow as fast as possible, the men have no other choice but to circle the island dozens of times. Everyone here knows that the whales can leave any day and head to a nearby island if something bothers them, which is exactly what happened last year. Laurent, do you see something? I'm sure it's there. No, I don't see the whales. The best thing we can do now is to go back. Then we'll see. Let's go. Bye. To kill time, Nahuma takes Laurent on a walk following paths through the island he knows in and out. We can maybe go up there a little farther to see if there are any whales? Yeah, sure. A major historical site is hidden on the east side of the island, the Anatane Uapoto Grotto. People say the Rurutu used to watch the arrival of the first whales from here. In the old days, this cave belonged to a whale hunter. For the first time, Nahuma talks to the scientist about an event his own father discussed because he was there, the last whale hunt on Rurutu in 1957. The hunters started by killing the calf, and because the mother wouldn't abandon it, she was killed as well. Metua remembers it as if it happened yesterday. He's the one who constructed the last whale boat with his own hands using rudimentary tools. Look, Laurent, this point can open up, and we used it to capture whales. And to kill them, we use this tool. This piece of sharp, flat iron went through the whale's skin, under its fin. 
One day, the harpoon whale drug several boats so far out that the fishermen couldn't see the island anymore. Okay, Laurent, let's go. The car's ready. All we gotta do is pack it up. Six weeks have gone by. There's not a minute to lose. The whales have returned to the now clear water of Arutu. But the sudden winter is slipping away, the water temperature rising. The females and their calves will soon head out on their way to Antarctica. For Laurent, Jan, and Nahuma, this is the last chance. Miraculously, Tapu and her calf are also back. It's a huge relief. Because time is so short and he's anxious about getting results, Laurent breaks his own rules and decides to force contact, something that should never be done with a wild animal. Exhilarated, he jumps in the water, grazing Tapu's immense black back 80 feet below. It's a failure. Inevitably. Laurent is only still alive because of the amazing delicacy of a 40-ton whale who carefully retracts her pectoral fin to let him swim back up. I don't know how to do this better, you know what I mean? In other words, I'm on the whale, I can't get any closer. The equipment, the tools, I don't know what else we can do. The net's one way, your little scraper is another. Maybe just using your hand if you manage to stay stable. But for that, I have to get closer than three feet. That's for sure. In any case, we're working on how to get closer to the animal. Then we'll see just what we can collect. There was a heavy swell, so it wasn't easy to keep my hand in place. And plus, it reacted more from fear, so... The calf will react depending on the mother. The mother's afraid, he'll be afraid. The mother feels safe, he feels safe. You have to keep trying to get closer, because in fact, in one day, we don't spend much time on the whale. We have to do more, so she gets used to us. And then you'll manage, you'll get your parasites, and we'll finish this off, right? I'm optimistic. You see, let yourself drift. There'll be a moment when you feel the current is pushing you towards the whale. Don't fight it. Let yourself float with it as if you were being carried along. And she'll understand better. She'll be less surprised than if you were kicking your fins. So you see, if you let yourself be carried to her, you'll end up in direct contact. And then there'll be some poor Siamide in front of you, and you will grab it. <laughs> By the hair if you have to. It's late August when they receive more bad news. A whale has suddenly appeared alongside Tapu and her calf. Laurent and Jan discover an escort. It's a young male who's not yet old enough to mate, but already has the instinct. He pursues Tapu tirelessly to protect her from other males. He probably hopes to seduce her and make her fertile. For several days, it's impossible to get close at all. Tapu has grown increasingly aggressive, rejecting the advances of the young male, expressing her anxiety by slapping the water hard with her fin, a movement mimicked by her calf. The mother's anxiety has spread to the men, who know the calf is still vulnerable. Right now, 
his survival is at stake. The battles are so violent they have left scars. Hundreds of strips of skin, squama, are floating in the water. Laurent rushes to collect this valuable genetic material, hoping to find cells still alive. Champion du monde. World champion. World champion. Tu sais, c'est comme... Comme si... You know, it's as if you won a gold medal at the Olympics. I think you must feel the same thing. <laughs> You've just done something you, you thought was completely impossible, and, and, and you won anyway. Clinging to these makeshift rafts, a few Siamidae floating in the current are caught. A miracle. The precious specimens are placed in a 70% alcohol solution, and the much desired encounter can finally take place. For the first time, a Siamidae taken from a living whale is observed under the microscope. Amazing. That's what you managed to get this afternoon. It's totally, you know, like it? It's extraordinary. And there you can even see its digestive tube. It's there, going down. It's transparent there, isn't it? Now we're starting to get some transparency. But I put it in lactophenol and it's even more amazing. It's almost an x-ray. Yeah, it's like an x-ray. You can literally see through it. Look at the pair of legs, here. You can see the joint right there. Exactly. Those are the joints between the different segments. And here, the claw it uses to cling to the animal. It's true, it's an unusual species, but it's not necessarily the one I was expecting to see. Oh yeah, is this a rare species? Well, in fact, it's a known species, but it's usually found on whales other than humpbacks. In fact, on the humpbacks, I was expecting to find CMS bupus, but the ones we collected are actually CMS balanoptra. It's a CMIDAE that exists on different species of orcals. Yet this discovery reveals an immense disappointment. Even though in the process, Laurent has just discovered a species of parasite previously unknown on humpback whales. To conduct his study and compare the parasites, the scientists must absolutely find Siamus bupis, the most common parasite in the species of whale. He's not interested in the exception. He can't use this discovery. In other words, he has to start all over again. It looks like a crab, you're right. It looks like a crab because it is one. A crustacean, like a crab. Can you see the claw? Uh -huh. There's one here, one here, one here. And they stick the claws into the whale's skin. Laurent can't use this biological material for his study, but he immediately agrees to a request from Giselle, Nahuma's wife, and a teacher on Rurutu. Why not take advantage of this opportunity to show the children what this strange animal looks like, and especially explain to them that the whales are endangered and must be protected? Mid-September. The whales are about to leave, Yan repeats over and over. This year, like every year, they come together before undertaking the long trip to the cold waters of Antarctica. Raymond! Raymond, we're gonna head for 270. For seven minutes. Laurent is tired and discouraged. Without really admitting it, he's thinking about giving up his quest. But to complete one part of the mission, he decides to undertake a third and final transect, a topographical record with which he can estimate one last time the exact number of humpback whales at Rurutu this year. Oh yeah, there are two blows there. Maybe the mother and the calf. No, there's two blows, two blows. Laurent notes the GPS coordinates of each animal he sees. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, Yan and Nahuma are following Tapu. Their faces reflect their determination. They will not give up. Wow. 
Let me see what happens when we get closer. See you later. Hey, Jan. Bring us back a piece of whale. Hey. A few days before he's scheduled to leave, Laurent enters his final data. In all, nine humpbacks were identified around Rurutu, three mothers and their calves, and three young males. In the 1950s, there were nearly 100 at Rurutu in a single season. I dove in first, I was alone with the whale. Jan is back and interrupts Laurent. They're not perfect, but I was pretty close. When I went back to the boat, we talked a bit with Nauma. I got back in the water, empty-handed, just to see how she reacted when I moved closer, to test it a bit. And there, the mother was asleep on the surface, completely asleep, and the calf was next to her, sleeping. But really, with his eyes closed, it was amazing, his eye really closed. So then I could get really, really close. I managed to get closer, closer, closer. The calf didn't wake up, it kept on sleeping. First, I put my hand on it to test it. His eye didn't budge. And then I said to myself, I'll take a little present back to Dr. Soulier. I started to scratch a bit with my finger. In fact, you just have to scrape a bit with your finger and it clings to your finger. Pull your hand away and the parasite is still clinging to your finger. I think I found a whole collection for you. <laughs> Jan has just handed Laurent the best gift this courageous, visionary, and determined scientist could hope for. Men may have walked on the moon, but Laurent is holding in his hands samples from another planet, that of the humpback whales he's determined to save. The result of eight weeks of work, and above all, the triumph of tremendous teamwork. It was like a contamination. They were climbing on my hand, and I had three or four on the top of my hand. It was wild. The calf didn't wake up. I managed to take three or four parasites off it, who then parasited me. In fact, it stings. It really stings. Really? Oh, yeah, I can tell you it stings. When the claws get into your skin, you really feel it. It's strong. The most amazing is that it didn't wake up. It was completely painless. He didn't feel anything, nothing at all. The mother didn't budge. That's ideal because there's no aggression toward the animal. And we still managed to get what we wanted. I hope that's it. Yes, yes. That's the CMS boobies. In fact, you can see they're still alive. We can see the bronze they're moving. They're moving. They're moving. They're moving. These men have achieved a first. Drawing on this physical and scientific accomplishment, they can draw up a protocol for collecting the parasites, which is essential for the study Dr. Laurent Soulier wants to conduct on a worldwide scale. Laurent now has to contact all the whale research centers to receive dozens of samples as quickly as possible. The infinitesimally small at work for the immensely large. It may sound mad, but it's not as crazy as all that. By revealing their origins, these strange animals may help scientists determine that humpback whales are not just one immense family, but rather dozens of distinct groups that must be protected individually. So that one of the most beautiful specimens of the animal kingdom, the humpback whale, can survive.